Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and we've got a really fun project for you today. So as you may know, Adam and I are big toy collectors. We love pop culture collectibles, and one of the ways we celebrate these collectibles, well, we paint them up, we display them, but we also photograph them. And there's a wonderful community of toy collectible photographers on places like Facebook and Instagram, one of whom I follow is Johnny Wu, aka Sergeant Bananas. We have his book here they release. He takes wonderful, wonderful pictures of 6th scale, 12th scale figures, pose, put in dioramas, and really brought to life with practical effects. And it turns out Johnny is in the Bay Area. So he invited us over to his home studio to watch him work and learn about how he infuses real world practical effects with toy photography. I'm so excited. Let's go check it out. Thank you so much for welcoming us into your studio. Absolutely. No problem. I'm glad to have you guys here. This is awesome. And uh, so from your work, you are a, a toy photographer. Yes. Um, and you have a, a great following on Instagram. You have beautiful photos, some of which are printed out mm -hmm. and put here be uh, behind us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how did you get started in this? Um, just being a lifelong toy collector. So about four, maybe five years ago, I got back into collecting the old Ninja Turtles line, like the Playmates line from the late 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. That was like, as a kid, that's what I loved. That's what my life was. So... I made an Instagram and I just posted pictures of my hauls be like, oh, this is what I got this week. And that kind of, I started using the hashtag like toy, action figure, and then eventually I started just searching those. And then I came across toy photography. Wow, like I couldn't really believe what I was seeing. Like I was like, oh, this is crazy. Like this is like, how do they do this, you know? And at that time I didn't pick up, pick up a camera or anything. I didn't even know how to use a camera back then. As the collecting kind of kept going, eventually i had to use some kind of creative energy and get get that out there somehow so one day i just had an idea of using um one of the characters mondo gecko he has a skateboard so i put him on a tech deck ramp this is my first toy shot ever i put him on there i took it it was it's so bad it's it's so bad but i was hooked like as soon as i took that it was like oh i should do this with this character and that with this character and it just it never stopped it was just I had all these ideas and it just more and more I started to realize like, oh, like there's something to this. Like I really like doing this and I'm not running out of ideas and it's just like I'm thinking about it all the time. So that's kind of how I got my start. And then like as things progressed, started photographing different types of toys, different characters, got a camera, learned how to use a camera and then started like get, jumping into the whole photography side of things and getting obsessed with that part too. Not just the toys, but also the photography aspect. And yeah, it just kind of brought me on this wild journey to where I am now. It's amazing because looking at your photos, I would have thought you were a photographer first <laughs> and then collector second. No, but it's... now it makes so much sense. It's because you love these figures and you know their stories and mm -hmm. you have the ideas first. Yeah, yeah. A lot of like, and you'll see like a lot. That's what when people ask like, what inspires you? Like, what is it that gets you to like create these images and this and that? Well, it's honestly the biggest thing is is you, is the toys themselves like because I'll like I'll be scrolling through like social media or something I'll see a company announce a figure immediately I'm like like ideas are going through my head left and right like ooh you could have them doing this with that with that character and so they provide so much of the inspiration that I that I have like for my shoots and everything the toys and when I see the toys it's like I'm reminded of what I've seen before right and yeah there we go and That's it's whether it. you're watching a movie you're reading a comic book mm -hmm. like the reason we have these toys is they are the physical manifestation of these things that we love yeah and they they have these like quintessential scenes mm -hmm. that they exist in the worlds they live in yeah. and in your photos those scenes are, are brought to whole I try, I try, right? So yeah, it's it's that's the perfect way to describe it because to me, like as a kid, and, and obviously even now as an adult, probably even worse, is my collection has gotten so like big and crazy, and it's like to me, anytime I really like something, like if I really like a character, the first thing I'm gonna look for is a figure of it because I I want that, I want the physical, like I want it's like uh, I want a Doc Brown or I want a a Star Wars figure or a Ninja Turtle or Ant-Man, whatever it is, it's like, I want the figure. I want to have it. I want to like mess with it, you know? And so. with high-end collecting right now, the manufacturing has gotten so much better, the articulation. Oh, yeah. Um, and even the licenses, the yeah. toys that we didn't know that mm -hmm. we could get this year for things that we loved 30 years ago. It's insane, like, how far, like, the technology and the engineering has come with figures from 
back from when I was a kid, you know, like they're awesome in their own right for like nostalgia factor and playing as a kid. But fast forward to now, like the movie Ninja Turtles and NECA just came out with this, the seven inch ones they released at the Comic-Con. I've wanted those figures my entire, and since the movie came out, like it was a dream of mine. Like I wanted that. It's like they reached into the movie and like pulled it out and put some articulation and you're like, here you go. So it was a dream come true to me. It's just uh, to have that and the detail, like the eyes, like the skin and just, and then when you start getting it with like different types of light and just really pops and then it starts to look like the movie again. And I, mm -hmm. that's one thing I'm really attracted to is like getting the lighting in there and just like trying to see like, how can I make this look like that scene or these scenes that I've seen, you know, like what am I, what can I do to do that? How can I put my own touch to it? Well, one of the things I love about your work is your use of practical effects. And it's, the lighting is amazing, the detail is amazing, but also things like smoke and rain and snow. Mm -hmm. So I uh, hear we get to check out some of your effects and watch you at work. Absolutely. Can we yeah. take a look? Yeah, definitely. All right, Johnny, so what is the scene we have here? So today I have Jin Erso from Star Wars Rogue One. This is the 1-6 scale Hot Toys figure. And I basically have her set up in this uh, this forest diorama. Um, this for these are these were made by a very talented artist on Instagram. He's at Terrafomer. He's insane. With <laughs> these things are all modular, as you can see, like they're little squares here. You can position them however you want. He included like this log and the rocks and everything. So I'm kind of just going for that kind of like Edu vibe, where she's like in the rain, you know, and she's in the rocks, kind of something like that. So I'm gonna do a rain effect here. I have my lights set up around here, so I'll turn those on, get the camera ready to go, and then get ready for the effect and do the rain effect. So this this like this happens kind of a lot where I like as I'm setting it up, I'm like realizing like wait that first initial idea isn't really like might not work as well, and then when I start to shoot like I'll start from like the the initial like probably like straightforward angle, and then like I'll kind of start to like you know pan around and just like look from different angles, like shoot from above, shoot from the side or whatever. And then, cause you never know, like however I have the lights set up, sometimes I don't even notice until I move. Like in the beginning, I would do all these like elaborate scenes where I had things on wires and it would take me forever to set up. And I would just shoot, I'd be like, kind of like a one and done. And it would just be like, ah, oh, like, I just spent like a half hour trying to get this Yoda to stick in the sand. And I shot it one way, but Probably if, you know, if I would have like looked around more, I could have got a better perspective. But this is like, this is things I've learned just over time. Like kind of just like a bird's eye view to like see like everything and where all the angles. And then you find, you, like you said, you just find like a mirror like, ooh, like that looks way better from that angle. Can you talk to me a little bit about the light setup here and what lights you're using? Because I see yeah, one, absolutely. two, three, four lights. Yes. I didn't realize there was that many lights. Yeah. So the reason why, okay, first of all, um, these are called loom cubes. These are these are the only lights that I use. I've used them for years now. I I find that they're perfect for they're perfect for all kinds of photography, but for me they really work for me because they're small. Mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, you can see like they're in the scene, yeah. but they're not in the scene. So they can be right in there, but they're out of the way. They're extremely powerful. Um, they come with all kinds of attachments. They have as you can see here, so there's this is a little barn door thing here, so you can direct the light with that. And then right here, there's a bunch of different gels. You have warming gels, diffusers, colored gels. And then also they just have, they just came out with these, the snoots as well. Um, so all these things can attach to them magnetically with, the, uh, with this piece here, they call a modification frame. So you can just pop this off, pop that on. It's, just, it's that simple. Cool. You can, as you can see, I have a diffuser there too. So if I wanted to put like a warming gel, I could just slap that over that. I mean, I could have this thing sticking out this far if I wanted to, I mean, but. I mean, it's like the miniaturized version of a big studio light. And yeah. you're using a lot of the same thing, it's just at smaller scale. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. You see like these mini snoots and the barn doors yeah. and the diffusers and they have, um, they have these bulb diffusers as well. So you can slap these on there. So it, it's just really cool. Like all the attachments for them and, and they're rechargeable, nine different brightness, set, nine or 10 different brightness settings. More than you need, more than you would need, but good to have. So, so. this scene here, um, you set up before, when you're posing the scene, I imagine you're, this is what you imagine in your head, right? So yeah. how do you think about what you want to pose in terms of the set dressing, the character, mm -hmm. what's the anatomy of the character like? Like how much attention to detail do you pay to that stuff? 
I try to, to pay as much attention to detail as I can. Um, obviously, there's always times where I go to like process a photo. I notice like, oh, that hand's like kind of awkwardly turned or but I really do try to like nail down everything I can first go. Obviously, it doesn't work that way. That's OK. But uh, I really I, th I think about all kinds of things like I knew that I wanted to have her like hunched over, you know, like in a sniper position. I knew like I, I know that the color of the photo that I'm going to adjust my white balance to like to give it that that kind of uh, moonlit like bluish vibe to it and then with the rain it'll look kind of hazy so to kind of emulate the scene from the movie mm. um having her hunched over on this the log just to help her prop up for that and then having her head turn so it's like looking like as if it was looking through the scope um and, and even the the way the clothes straight yeah yeah like and kind of have the well. hood partially over over the the hat here her head um so yeah each each scene like even though it may look very simple a lot of thought does go into it um and then you'll see it w when i start doing the effect too i'm very very picky about how it how it looks and like where it's coming from and in terms of like is it going to be in the foreground or is it going to be in you know the background or maybe both or is it going to come from the side it, there's a lot of factors that go into that but typically i get the scene in my head i'll start to set it up i'll get every, i'll kind of figure that all that out i'll put the posing um, where where the figure is set up in the, the environment all that stuff then at the very end I'll think okay like would an effect benefit this photo does it need it maybe okay if it does then what effect it's like what do I want to use to like really tell the story more is it going to be rain is it going to be snow um, smoke a firework or you know wh whatever it may be dust or something and then I figure that out because I don't I like to have the whole all those other things kind of checked off before I go into the effect part because um, I've been doing effects for so long like I know that I know I know how to do the rain effect that's I don't have to like it's almost secondary it's like I can do it it's not I don't have to sit there and like concentrate like I wonder if I'll be able to capture it I know I can do it so I'd rather get all this other stuff like kind of squared away first that way when I do it I know that it should probably it'll probably work out hopefully. So that's your first test shot right now. Mm -hmm. And even though it looks very bright, it looks like you're exposing pretty low for this. Mm -hmm. So that light is not harsh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to have it all like, I don't, I like to have very moody, dramatic. This is good. This is a moody, dramatic scene. So I like, you know, I don't want anything to be like super bright and like blown out or something. Like it's just enough giving some highlights from the back to kind of give the, the rim lighting of the figure. And then the, the one on the face too to just bring out her eyes and then enough light back there I, I, hopefully so when the rain comes down it'll the light will catch it and make it pop all right so how are you gonna do the rain so this is how i do rain this is a pressurized weed sprayer um and then i just basically turn it all the way down to like the mist it's so you pump it up and then basically what i'm gonna do is I'm going to look here and I'm going to spray down a little bit and, and see how it give it, you know, it's a kind of a test run. So I'll do that now. And it looks like you're shooting at a pretty high shutter because yes. for so, rain, different shutters give you different effects. Exactly. So for me and the, the way that I want to capture this, like I wanted to, to freeze those drops. So that's why you have, I have the fast shutter. So it just picks it up right away. It's just the direction that I want to go with the photo. I could do, use a slower shutter, but as you said, it would look different. So if you use a slow shutter speed, you get the, the lines, the, the you know longer lines, which might fit for your scene. I do it sometimes myself, um, but for this scene, I want the, the droplets you know to be frozen. So that's why I'm using the fast shutter speed. All right. This shot worked out. I like the way that it, they look. The lighting is is good on it. I'm just not nothing bothers me here. The the rain effect looks pretty good. Um, I'm pretty picky about the effect. Like I like to have some some of the drops in the background and foreground to create like that so to get the bokeh effect on some of the drops. I like I like just having that depth in the effect itself. 
And this is um, a macro lens you're using. Macro, yeah, 90 millimeter macro. Uh, which for this scene, it doesn't take a lot of filling up the detail mm -mm. for it to look full in your yeah, frame. Exactly, yeah. The, the, so, I mean, you can see here, it's just on a table. Like there's nothing in front of her. It's just a white table, which would be completely out of place in this scene, but you can't see it. Just the way that it's being um, composed here. So yeah, like even though like you're basically just getting a glimpse into like part of her body and then like a little bit of like the trees to the to the right and left and that's that's about it. But enough to sell the scene of what I was trying to go for. Okay, Johnny, so we're your computer now. You've imported a bunch of photos. Mm -hmm. How many photos do you usually take per session? It varies. For this particular one, there was 158 out of the, out of the shoot. Mm -hmm. so. And here, these are your four selects then? Yeah, so these are four that um, some of them, I, like, I don't, let's see, three out of the, the four I marked in camera just because something about them caught my eye. So that's why those are here. And then ultimately I chose the one that I wanted to edit. Um, is that something you usually do as you're taking batch shots you go yeah. through and, and mark? Yeah, I always do that. Um, just because sometimes I do, I know I'm going to take a lot of photos. So it's just helpful when you get it into um, Photoshop or you're uploading it. You can see the ones that have been starred. So you can kind of go straight to those and kind of know like, oh yeah, those are the ones that caught my eye. And sometimes like I'll just be scrolling through just, just like of the, over the other images that I didn't star. And I won't, I won't even look, but then like I'll reconfirm basically the ones that I start because I'm like, oh, that's one, but it's already starred. Got so it. it's kind of cool yeah. that I was like, oh yeah, so that is definitely the one, yeah. like when it happens twice like that. Reinforced. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah yep, the thing. The Sometimes one. it's subconscious, mm -hmm. right? It's like you you star it in the moment and then when you pull it in, you're like, okay, now I understand why, mm -hmm. what combination of elements made this work. And it is elements we're talking about, the rain here. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are the things that you like or don't like about each of these? So the reason I chose these four, uh, I liked the way the effect look, looked in them. Like the, the out of focus, in focus, the rain effect. I liked the way it looked. Like the dispersion, like the evenness of, of the rain looked good in these. So that's what ultimately why I, I narrowed it down to these four in particular. Mm, and then the one you chose, uh, you've done some post-processing work, but you liked it because it had enough rain? Yeah, it just, it had... It, it just had it. It just it was just the one. It was kind of you know you, as a photographer like most photographers like they know like you know when you got there's like the one that sticks out and that was the one that out of the four that kind of stuck out to me just everything about it I guess like the way the rain looked more so it was more a little bit more heavy I think in that photo in particular than the others and uh, the out of focus drops I, I just like the bokeh on this one a little bit more than the others so mm -hmm. that's why I went with it. So now you've brought the photo, the one you've liked, into Photoshop. So mm -hmm. what is your post-process here? So the first thing that I did was I brought up the levels of the photo and just like brightened it up a little bit, you know, expo you know brought the exposure up in certain areas. After I was done with that and I got something that I liked, uh, I went into the color balance and I just started, I basically kind of just messed with the colors a little bit, kind of just tweak things here and there and kind of just see like the tones, the way it changes the tones until I get something that I like. and. That's pretty much it. That was pretty much it with this photo. There wasn't really a whole lot going on as far as like, I didn't have to remove a, a, a wire just because the figure was just sitting there. So mm -hmm. it was pretty straightforward. I mean, the effect that there's, you know, the effect is already there. So I don't have to Photoshop that in as practical. So that's another, a plus, you know, <laughs> save some time there. Um, and I'm looking at, it's not more than two dozen or so just operations. It's mm -hmm. very minimal in terms of what you can do to a photo. Right. Can we see the before and after? Yeah. So this is like, this is, this is right here is before, like when I uploaded it and then see how it changed a little bit. It became a little more green. The tones are a little gr more green and it's exposed a little bit more. That looks wonderful. Wow. Awesome. And we can look forward to seeing this on your Instagram. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Johnny. This is super educational and personally for me, huge geek out moments. I've been such a big fan of your work. Yeah, no thank problem. Thank you for welcelcoming us in the uh -oh. studio. And we'll have to come back and learn more about your other processes. Yeah, yeah, definitely.